The news tonight is a true rarity in politics and in law. A man who ran the current president's campaign marched into court today, pled guilty to two federal counts, and then made a deal to cooperate with special counsel Bob Mueller. This is the highest ranking Trump political aide to plead guilty in this very much still active probe. In fact, you can't get higher on the campaign because he was running it for a period of time. And this high stakes legal and political move comes after, of course, months of resistance. Consider how Manafort's world shrunk to that cell that he was inhabiting in pretrial detention based on his illegal resistance in the form of witness tampering. Well, today, that resistance stopped. That tampering stopped. Those games stopped. Manafort pleading guilty just days before he was going to face his second federal trial at the hands of Bob Mueller and his aggressive prosecutors. And note, this deal comes after weeks of hints from Trump that he was thinking about some kind of deal or pardon on his side and even publicly praising Paul Manafort for not being a flipper. That has been made untrue today. Manafort flipping. Prosecutors can now ask him anything they want. So right now, before we get to some very talented experts on all of this breaking news, I want to go through the facts with you tonight. When the judge asked Manafort in court today, how do you plead? He answered, as many a defendant has, very simply, quote, I plead guilty. His deal orders him in writing to cooperate fully, truthfully, completely, and forthrightly with the government, that's Mueller, in any and all matters that the government, that's Mueller, deems relevant, which means he can be interviewed about his participation, his knowledge of all criminal activities, those documents that we've seen them fight over in many cases, well, that ends now, that fighting. He has to turn over all the documents. He can even potentially have to participate in undercover activities. We don't know if he would, according to Mueller's orders, but he has to agree to. And he has to, and this is a big one, take a look, testify at any proceeding Bob Mueller orders. That could include grand juries. It could include open court. So while the White House is rushing out to say that these crimes that Manafort confesses to were not related to Trump, that's their argument, that may not mean anything. It may not be true. And it's going to be up to, under the law now, Paul Manafort to tell Mueller's team anything they want to know, which can include, of course, his work for the Trump campaign or anything that involves Trump before and after. So that, of course, goes into the strike zone of this whole probe. What did happen inside that Trump Tower meeting? Why did the RNC mysteriously change language to help Putin on Ukraine at that RNC convention? What other contacts were there with Russians or their cutouts and anything else about the ties between Donald Trump's campaign and Russia? Are there any ties between Mr. Trump, you or your campaign and Putin and his regime? No, there are not. It's absurd. Manafort tonight is back in jail before what will ultimately be sentencing for all of this. Now, he faces a decade in prison for those two crimes he confessed to today, plus separate time for the conviction in Virginia. Mueller's team was in a celebratory mood as they filed into the courtroom today. They were led by Andrew Weissman. He is the one you may have heard about on this very show because Trump allies have warned that he is ruthless with defendants and that he virtually always wins. Well, we're seeing that tonight. Now, Manafort has to forfeit several of his very luxurious properties. That includes homes in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Hamptons. But perhaps most importantly to many people, it will include his infamous apartment in Trump Tower itself. That, of course, that residence was part of Paul Manafort's pitch to Trump that he should be hired as a volunteer, quote unquote, on the campaign. Tonight, Paul Manafort joins a new group, a group of people who have been Trump aides who've gone on to plead guilty at the hands of the federal government. Let's get right to a very important panel we've put together for this very important news night. Former counsel of the mayor of New York City, Maya Wiley, who's also served as a civil prosecutor in the Southern District, which is so relevant to these issues. David Korn, Washington Bureau Chief for Mother Jones, as well as two former federal prosecutors, Seth Waxman and Patrick Cotter, who prosecuted mob boss John Gotti. Uh, my thanks to all of you. This is one of those days. Uh, Maya, when you look at what Bob Mueller got here, is there anything he wanted that he didn't get out of Manafort, or is this a complete fold? This is a complete fold. You can't read it any other way. And I keep, I thought about you tonight, Ari, and I thought about Vince Staples. Uh, it's about hot as 6,500 degrees in the White House right now as a result <laughs> of this. So 
all, if you look at what happened, if he, Paul Manafort had said before that he didn't want to cooperate where Donald Trump was concerned, and now here he is fully cooperating wherever Mueller's questions take him and into any venue that Mueller wants to take him. That is huge. And remember, it's both the Trump Tower meeting, it's also the fact that he, Mueller said in the Virginia filings that he thought that there were reasons to per want to know about um, creating a back channel to Russia. That was explicit, and that's something we know he's got to be talking to uh, Manafort about. And another thing to just remember, he didn't agree to uh, uh, give Manafort a cooperation agreement unless he had heard sufficiently enough from Manafort to make it worth his while. Well, that's, that's very important what you say there. And Patrick, uh, you were analyzing this earlier today and saying there is just a tremendous amount of valuable information uh, that changes today, that yesterday that information uh, it, it may have been under Paul Manafort's right as a defendant to withhold and try to use strategically as he prepares for trial. And today that all, ultimately all becomes uh, basically Robert Mueller's intellectual property. Explain. Paul Manafort was in the inner circle with Trump during all the time period that uh, Mueller is most interested in. So now Mueller has that. Paul Manafort was chairman of the committee, uh, uh, sorry, the campaign. So he knows where the money moved. So Mueller has all that, and that includes the money to Cohen, that includes the money to mistresses, et cetera. Uh, Manafort uh, was at the famous Trump Tower meeting. Uh, he knows who knew about that meeting, he knows who talked about that meeting, and he knew, knows who got reports about that meeting. Mueller has all that. Uh, Manafort, I also think a huge contribution he makes to Mueller is that he is going to corroborate a lot of what Flynn and Gates and Papadopoulos and other people are going to say and have mm. said, that is huge. He has made every single witness that Mueller has stronger. David Korn. Well, you know, I, I, the way I look at it, Bo, uh, Paul Manafort had a choice. He had two guys he had to decide who to trust. One was Donald Trump, who couldn't be more explicit in saying, I will give you a pardon. If you don't rat me out, I will give you a pardon. He sent that message over and over again. Or Bob Mueller, who said, cooperate with me. You'll probably still have to do time. You have to give up millions of dollars in your assets, and you'll have to cooperate and tell me everything. And he had to decide which way to go. And he ended up trusting Bob Mueller more than he trusts hmm. Donald Trump. So that's where he is today. And in addition to talking about the Trump Tower meeting and campaign money issues, he knew that George Papadopoulos was trying to set up a back channel between Putin's office and the Trump campaign. And we know he was also good friends with Roger Stone and would have been Roger Stone's point of contact if Stone was involved. And I say if he was involved in any chicanery to try to help the campaign with or without the Russians. So he is a guy at the center of so much. And I mean, we're all sitting here waiting for the Trump tweets because this puts Trump into even a, what is it, a deeper corner? How, how far back can he be pushed? Uh, well, Seth, what message does this send to anyone else who thinks uh, they could stare down Bob Mueller and, and defy him and win? They are thinking about giving up. They're thinking about where they're going to go and where they can get their bread buttered, and that's with Bob Mueller. You know, for everyone else that's sitting out there, you know, Roger Stone, for example, this is a bad day, obviously a very bad day for the president. And, the, you know, my biggest takeaway from this in the broad spectrum of what's going on from a prosecutor's perspective is that Mueller's been climbing this ladder, and he is reaching the highest rungs of this ladder. And I think the next step for Mr. Mueller is to target those very, the closest to the president. That's Donald Trump. Jr. and Jared Kushner, who are participants in that infamous Trump Tower meeting and were maybe a part of this quid pro quo, this idea of accepting dirt on Clinton in exchange for a future promise to reduce or eliminate sanctions against Russian oligarchs and Russian senior officials. If that illegal quid pro quo took place, you could have incredibly serious federal charges that are brought against Don Jr. and Kushner. If you get those two under indictment, you are on the doorstep to the presidency. So if I'm the president, I'm sitting very uncomfortably tonight. Right, and you're, you're zeroing in on, on whether there was a crime 
that was conspired or committed through the Trump Tower meeting, Seth. And so, Maya, that, of course, is an issue both as an investigative side. Did that happen? And then, as all fair prosecutors have to do, on a probative side, which is, do you have enough to win the case? In other words, you wouldn't necessarily, as a responsible prosecutor, want to hang that entire case against a senior person or a presidential family member on only George Papadopoulos, our, our proverbial barista in this story. Um, but if he's a barista, Paul Manafort is Howard Schultz. No offense to Howard Schultz, but he's running all of Starbucks nationally. I mean, he's in charge. And so I, I put that to you, Maya, and I'm reading here from uh, the agreement that says the defendant, that's Manafort, quote, agrees to testify at any proceeding requested by Mueller. Where does that fit into any case they might ever want to prove regarding what happened in the meeting? Yeah, I mean, it fits in directly. The point being that Manafort is a person who must have salient information, uh, and in, and he is now obligated to provide it. And he's also someone who, by the way, has demonstrated that he's going to obstruct justice. So you know, um, the question becomes, what did he know about also how they were obstructing justice in terms of the conversations about that meeting? Because as we know. They lied about why they were having that meeting in the first place. You know, this, this, there is, I completely agree with Seth, there's nowhere else for this to go but to the next rung of that ladder. And it can't look good for anybody. Plus, I just think there's so much we can't know about what else Robert Mueller knows about who else. I'm not sure that we know yet all the folks who are going to be implicated in this. And now that Mon Manafort has to share that information. We'll, well see. And you, you just put your finger on something that goes to the difference between politics, uh, where lying can be commonplace, uh, and court, where uh, certain types of lies to obstruct justice are themselves separate felonies. And David, again, reading, mm -hmm. we have these rich new documents, so I'm going to keep yeah. reading from them. It's the only time the special counsel's office ever speaks is, is through mm -hmm. these formal documents. Uh, they made a point here to get him to plead, uh, David, to a conspiracy against the U.S. to, quote, to obstruct justice by tampering with witnesses while on pretrial release. Uh, what do you think of Bob Mueller's repeated message here that regardless of what Alan Dershowitz or Rudy Giuliani says on TV, conspiracy to obstruct justice is a felony? You know, Robert Mueller plays it hard. He, you know, he, he didn't blink in this case. He was willing to bring the second trial to trial. And he, as Maya said, he got Manafort to completely fold. So if you're involved in this case and you haven't come to that conclusion yet, you're going to, I think, end up in a world of hurt. And one line of inquiry that we haven't seen a lot of yet, but which could be of, uh, 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 could be a threat to many of the participants here, including people who Seth was referring to a moment ago is lying to Congress. A lot of these guys have come up and given private testimony to the congressional committees. And if you have Manafort out there talking about what really happened, and if he can show, as other uh, witnesses have tended to show, that some of these testimonies were not accurate, it, it opens up a whole other realm hmm. of exposure for some of these very senior people in the Trump Russia scandal. Uh, Patrick, you have prosecuted the mafia. Do you see any parallels to how Mueller has uh, slowly but surely made this progress, culminating in this uh, conviction tonight? Absolutely. This is classic climbing up the ladder, as Seth said, at the top, to get to the top of the organization. Uh, I think the fact that he f gets Mueller is very analogous to what gets, happened when we got Manafort, Sam, I'm mean. sorry, what he gets Manafort is that it's very analogous to what happened when we got Gravano. Uh, it led directly to bringing down the boss. And everybody else in the family then realized that if Gravano can be taken down, if Gotti can be taken down, then what chance do we have? And I think that's what everybody else who was involved in the Trump campaign and the Russia connections has to be thinking to themselves tonight. If right. Manafort Patrick, with his money couldn't do it, what could we do? My last question before I lose you, because uh, you are our mafia prosecutor, you have seen tough people and you could be tough in a good way or a bad way in this world, but you've seen tough people who've had their minds change. We know Paul Manafort saw himself as very tough. I mean, he was out in other countries uh, where he knew he was in physical danger. He was dealing with some very unsavory characters. He came back here and was still witness tampering uh, as a last bid. Do you have any uh, insight for our viewers who are trying to understand this, just as we all are, when and how was it that he went from all of that 
uh, to, to this change that, that culminates to, to tonight's news? Sure. There's tough and then there's stupid. Uh, you can be tough, but you don't necessarily have to be stupid. He did the math. He saw what the government did to him in Virginia. He saw what was coming. And as tough as he was, he figured it out. And as it was pointed out earlier, he decided he couldn't trust President Trump, so he decided to trust Robert Mueller. Right, which is it's so interesting you say that uh, from your experience dealing with some of these hardened folks, uh, David Korn saying it, I think, from a journalistic perspective, but that is what hangs over all of this, especially with a White House that is, um, as shall we say, inconsistent as this one about, about whether uh, Donald Trump was going to do what he intimated he might do. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.